cardiologist and image consultant at the Royal Brompton. And they are both the leads for the left, left ventricular outflow track obstruction programs at their affiliated hospitals. Uh, and we have a very interesting debate between the two of them today. Hand over to uh, Dr. Tome and Dr. Pazin. Hello, everyone. Well, right. Hello. I think we are on. Are on? We? Yeah, I think we are. No? We can, yes, you are on. Yes. Here. Perfect. Far away. Thank you. So, yeah, that's a very interesting topic. I'm Antonis Pantazis. I'm a consultant at the Royal Brompton in Herfield. And I also chair the European Society of Cardiology group for uh, cardiomyopathies, where Mighty is actually a member of the nucleus as well. And in the next few minutes, we will um, give you uh, some hints about the management of left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Um, we called it a debate. Um, it may not be exactly a debate, it may be a discussion. Mighty and I have been working together since 2004 on this particular uh, subject on, on delivering a service on LVT obstruction. And we have debated several times on several things, but today I think we will probably come to an agreement about most of the things. So um, we, the format of the talk is going to be a discussion. So I have a start question for you. So what's the alpha drug obstruction? What's, what, what are we talking about, Antoni? Yeah, I think it's good actually to understand what the left ventricular outflow tract obstruction is because we obviously associate it uh, most of the time with uh, hypertrophic cardiopathy and the thick heart. However, uh, if you look at this image where you see at the top the left atrium, at the bottom the left ventricle and on the right hand side the, the aorta, um, what is actually blocking the left ventricular outflow which is between the, the aortic valve and the mitral valve and on top of the interventricular septum is the mitral valve. So it's not the thick septum, it's not anything else, it's just the movement of the mitral valve which blocks the, um, the left ventricular outflow, outflow tract flow. And this may be uh, very much linked to uh, the thickness of the, of the uh, septum, but it's not the actual thickness, thickness that blocks the, the outflow. In actual fact, a number of factors have been identified over the years which play a role uh, different in, the, in, in, in uh, between patients, but uh, a significant role altogether in the development of this pathology. And just for the sake of the discussion here, you can see that the position of the papillary muscles down here plays a significant role. The length of the mitral valve leaflet here plays a role. The thickness does play a role as well. The angulation between the aorta and the plane of the mitral valve and the, uh, and the rest of the heart and the interventricular septum plays a role. And if you, if this is not complex enough, these factors are also dynamic, so they can change as the heart contracts. So it's not just how we see them on a still image, but they also move uh, during systole, they change over diastole, and they uh, influence a lot the flows within the left ventricle and in the outflow tract. So, but my Antonis, yeah, go on. No, but do you think that then all the patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have left ventricular alpha tract obstruction? Well, not really. Uh, I think there are patients who are not obstructive, and no matter what tests we, we do, they don't show any obstruction. However, this question is very important because actually a number of patients may have obstruction which has not been identified because it can only happen in dynamic circumstances. And if we don't test them with the right diagnostic investigations, we may not find it. So to answer the question, um, it, you know, statistically, I think uh, uh, something like 70% of them are expected to have obstruction, but depends a lot on the methods we use to uh, investigate the obstruction. But coming back to you now, what are the consequences of this obstruction? We saw how it happens there, but what happens to the heart because of this obstruction? So I thought they would be useful to remind everyone that <clears throat> this gradient that we're talking about occurs between the left ventricular cavity, as you can see in this slide, and the alpha tract. So therefore, in every bit, we are generating an increased 
pressure in the ventricular cavity again and again that can change with circumstances, it can be lower, it can be higher over the course of everyday activities. So what, what might happen in the heart as a result of that? Next slide. We can see, you know, what the effort might be to open that area, how the mitral valve is pushing to there. So while patients might have very minor symptoms or so they might not identify the symptom themselves, or those symptoms might present in an acute or chronic manner, the patient might critically have exertional chest pain due to what, you know, is a, a, a problem within the man of the, uh, the wall stress and what we can offer uh, while we are pushing uh, that gradient, we can have an acute decrease on the on the outflow. So therefore we'll have a syncope, we'll have backwards flow, we will have mitral regurgitation, dyspnea, and this can be a substrate for arrhythmias and disease progression. We also know that we have learned to understand that afrotrack construction might change the heart in a way that it might influence in the way that disease manifests and in fact has been added to some of the way that we do the risk stratification, suggesting <clears throat> that has got some um, relationship with the prognosis or at least in a modifier fashion. So is there a linear relationship between the level of obstruction, the severity of obstruction, and, and those consequences? So the, the honest truth is that even though a lot has been written about it, we probably don't know because a given patient might have different gradients in the same day. So the consequences of what has been attributed in a paper of a given gradient is difficult to understand. However, if you look overall, you can realize that higher gradients and sicker hearts they probably are in, in some, some degree of relationship and you might understand that you start with a gradient at the age of 30. My, a very severe gradient at the age of 30 might have a big influence over the course of your life and even your life expectancy rather than the angulated septum gradient you might have at your 70s. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right actually and this is probably why the Americans do not include the obstruction in the risk stratification because they think that there is a relationship, but not a linear one. And or in other words, we don't really know what the relationship with the risk. So what do you think, Antony, then is the state of the art of the assessment of a patient with the ventricular aphrodrug structure? Right, this is becoming now my favorite slide in the last few months or so, because it actually demonstrates, I think, in a nice way what happens to the, some of these patients they become symptomatic very early in life or when the condition manifests itself and they give up a number of activities. So when we ask them in clinic whether they have symptoms or not, they often say no. But if we go a little bit deeper under the surface, we may find out that they actually do very little in order to avoid symptoms. And this is something that needs to be part of the assessment. We need to focus on the, on the symptoms, but also on the circumstances around them. And the circumstances, given that this obstruction is dynamic, can be a number of things. Can be everyday activities like gardening, can be food and meals, which may trigger more obstruction um, than, uh, than what, it, it, when, what it is at rest. Can be dehydration, um, very little exercise like going up the stairs, and even alcohol. Uh, and imagine what will happen if this happens, if all this coincide in, in some circumstances. If a patient, for example, goes on holidays and they have a good meal, but they're a little bit dehydrated in a hot environment and they take a bit of exercise. But on the other hand, if they're sitting down all day, they may not have symptoms. So we need to understand exactly the, the patient's profile. And then we have some diagnostic tests which we can perform. Uh, and these I will not obviously go into detail because you probably know them already, um, such as the uh, ECG, the echocardiogram, the dynamic echocardiogram, which is very important. And by dynamic, we mean a number of maneuvers, but obviously never uh, pharmacological uh, echocardiogram um, in this condition. And the, the CMR, the exercise test, even without imaging, and the Holter monitor. And one can, can think of more tests, but this is a basic list of, of tests. 
However, we may still not have the full picture, mighty. And this is what you have uh, a number of times challenged me about. So that's, this slide is very important for me and anyone who knows me will be reminded of this every time we talk about a patient. So you might have a gentleman or a lady who has had this, uh, this wall thickness the same, has got the same elongated mitral valve on a given day, start, starting being symptomatic. So you need to wonder what has happened, what is the trigger, and what might be any alternative or additional or worsening problems that might be happening. Um, we might all be reminded of the a lady who might have severe menorrhagia that is secondary to fibromas who runs with hemoglobins of eight and has got a very severe elementary obstruction giving her beta blockers and the poor lady cannot breathe. So this is the case I want you to remember for this slide. So the importance of this is to be systematic. We always need to consider what other factors we can treat any alternative uh, uh, reasons for the symptoms. And then we need to be very systematic that to understand what is the mechanism of obstruction or any other um, significant data that might help us to make a plan for the patient. So when should this left ventricular arthro tract obstruction be treated? Well, <clears throat> we go to the next slide. I'm gonna change the question a little bit. Does it need treating? What are we treating? Are we treating the numbers? What we are doing? Funny enough, the literature sort of focus a little bit that significant gradients any, anywhere from 30. And this has been based on some studies that they have shown some perhaps prognostic value on those with less than 30 and more than 30. However, the data, as we have explained before, is a little bit weak given the variability of the findings. The truth is that in the absence of symptoms, there is very little evidence that modifying the gradient is going to, to, to do anything. And we have a real mandate to treat these patients, but we need to follow them up and perhaps systematically assess them. The, it is also important that the, we are treating always the patient, not the number, and therefore we need to um, integrate the evaluation and the treatment of the gradient within the risk profile of this patient before making any assumptions and evaluate the symptoms as we have discussed before. Next slide. You might wonder, yes, but the gradient might happen in acute situations. So this is very important here to see what you can correct. And the first thing, thing first was the trigger. And this is will be a using for, for acting. I'm not going to go through the whole slide, but you have it for the future and this will be very useful for you, particularly when you are in, in the uh, ITU and you have a patient who has developed very acute alpha drug obstruction after giving him, giving him some vasoactive drugs. And so consider all these steps and consider what can you change. The most common situation is the next slide, however, is the of a drug obstruction that we evaluate in the outpatient department. So we will be having to learn how to question our patients and how to know that the patient might themselves not to be aware what that the symptoms that come and go, they are very much related to the variability of the gradient and the provocation situation. We might need to understand systematically what minimum data set we need to understand what's happening. And then always document, you know, the modifiers of the severity of the alpha drug obstruction and explain them the situation that might make worse the gradient so they can always cleverly adjust themselves uh, to situations that make less risky to go on with their own lives. Acknowledging all the problems that this obstruction causes, is it maybe logical to try to treat the obstruction earlier than later? Well, I think that's probably the most important question of the talk, and I'm hoping that together we're going to get a conclusion by the end of the presentations. So I move on the question. Hmm? Oh, you skipped it. All right. So um, what are the currently viable methods for the management of obstruction, Antonis? So very briefly, we start from medication and medication is not designed. This medicate, this list of drugs is not designed for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. They are drugs which have been obviously used in other conditions 
but we are using them here only because they have a negative inotropic effect and we thought to take advantage of that. Pita blockers, some calcium antagonists, disopyramide for its negative inotropic effect. All these drugs have side effects and they don't only work on the heart, they work on the whole body. And some patients feel better on these drugs because they are uh, relieved from their obstructive symptoms and they don't get much of side effects. Other patients feel about the same because on balance they can do as much as they could do previously. And some patients may even feel, feel worse. And we always need to keep an open mind about it. And the point here is not to titrate those drugs to the maximum dose regardless of side effects and regardless of, of what the, the, their effect on the patient's lifestyle is. The point is to give the patients a better life. Other drugs have also been used uh, in, in the green line at the, at the bottom. You can see a few drugs that have been used with variable uh, success. Um, one can consider them, but they have specific indications and some discussion needs to take place beforehand. This algorithm here only suggests what I just said, that uh, the, the symptomatic patient uh, needs to be tried on medication first and some combinations of that. We usually start on beta blockers, verapamil, as an alternative or diltiazem and tisopyramide usually together with beta blockers or verapamil because there is a risk that it may accelerate the AV conduction in some patients. And one needs to keep an eye on the ECG and Holter monitors and QT intervals, especially when they use tisopyramide. But all these precautions, of course, need to be taken on board uh, for uh, as, the, as we treat the patient. And if all this doesn't work, then we have some invasive uh, types of treatment. One of them is pacing the heart from the right ventricle, usually the, the apex of the right ventricle, hoping that the change in contraction will uh, reduce the obstruction. That's just an example. It doesn't happen in all patients, but you can see here that the paced beats are associated with uh, obviously a lower velocity. The non-paced beat is associated with higher velocity. A, a number of patients do respond to this. Maybe it's about 15 to 20 percent and is usually considered as an alternative if the, um, the other methods are not um, uh, applicable. And when I'm saying the other methods, I'm talking about the alcohol septal ablation, um, which is a method that allows us to go into one of the septal branches. And after we check where we are with contrast, echo contrast, then we inject alcohol and cause a controlled uh, myocardial infarction in the thick area of the basal septum, hoping that this will stop the, um, the mechanism of obstruction. But <clears throat> as you have heard at the beginning of this presentation, the mechanism is quite complex and it's not just the thick septum, therefore it cannot work in all patients. However, it's also considered as an alternative to what comes next. And what comes next is the surgical myectomy plus a number of other things uh, inside the, the heart, inside the left ventricle which puts everything in, in a good place so that the obstruction then is less likely to happen during um, uh, exertion. And this can include shortening of the mitral valve lift, leaflet, repositioning of the uh, papillary muscles, uh, amending other uh, anatomical elements within the ventricle. It's a quite complex procedure as it is now performed um, in centers with experience. But Antonis, are all these possibilities available in all centers, including the expertise or use different medications? No, the quick answer is no. And this is not just uh, an observation from uh, London or the UK. It's an international issue that the, the expertise for, for uh, these procedures altogether is uh, concentrated in some centers. And in a way, if there is an expertise in all of them, it's very difficult to choose what is best for the patient. And, and, and advise the patient accordingly because uh, many centers have one uh, of these methods available. They will obviously offer this method to a patient. In a way, it's good to offer to the patient what a center is experienced in, but uh, the best approach is actually if all of them are available with some reasonable expertise so that uh, the, uh, the treatment is uh, tailored to the patient's needs. And talking about that, um, which method should be considered then for the treatment of the left ventricular atrial tract obstruction? So, we move to the next slide. So, we will agree 
the, the idea of solution is that one that has got very little risk, has got very low risk of major complications, has got an acceptable risk of minor complications, has got very little long term sequelae, and the success persists. The patient recovers very quickly, and whoever is doing procedures or whatever we're doing with the patient has got very little time to learn the technique. So this idea solution is found, you know, probably to the question, you know, so we address the 11 to graph for drug obstruction in an earlier stage, the answer probably will be for many patients, particularly the young ones, probably yes. The next slide. So what do we have to have in mind? The first thing is every patient should be offered medical treatment and sometimes the most important thing they need to be advised and are made aware of the limitations and what things are side effects and what things are limitations so they don't get stuck on the same treatment with no expectations to get any better. We will have to get into account again in a methodological fashion. Was the anatomy of patients? Have they got any other pathologies that might need surgery anyway, like valve issues or coronary artery disease? What is the age of a patient? Has he got major comorbidities? What's the expertise where I'm practicing in my area? What, what can I offer? What's the safest procedure that I can offer my patient? And then listen to them. What's the preference? You have, you know, a picture of a myectomy that you will see in the slide that where the bundle is. So be very aware that we'll be in a very extensive myectomy, we'll be causing a left bundle branch block. So if the patient has already got some conduction abnormalities, we might end it with a patient dependent patient. And we'll have in the in alcohol septal ablation, given the position of the bundle very common, we will end it with a right bundle branch block type of a picture. So we have to get all those things into account. So this is for both of us, no? So how well, do the decision of, for the management of the left ventricular obstruction should be made? Well, actually, the, the answer is not by the two individuals who are delivering the talk today. So it's a negative slide, this one. And the point is that the care and, and the decision should be made in a holistic way. Nowadays, we have moved away from the single expert who knows about the disease, who knows about the condition and makes all the decisions. And especially in a complex disease like this one, the care and the, and the decision should be made in a multidisciplinary way. Not just in multidisciplinary meetings, but the whole care should be multidisciplinary. Starting from the patient's symptoms at the top left, talking to the patient, explaining all about the, the condition and the symptoms, thinking about the feasibility and advantages of any treatment available, taking into account risks and the risks of the treatment options, what happens if we treat the uh, obstruction, what happens if we don't, um, taking into account also technical details, going back to the patient, discussing again with the patient, and if the patient is uh, considered to be eligible for one of them, preparing the patient in, in, a, in an absolutely great way for a procedure which is elective. So, it's not a procedure that should be done quickly with uh, uh, any cost, any risk, because it's an elective procedure at the end, and it has to be done in a perfect way, if if that's possible. So, so how how do we put together such a team? You know, how do we put together all these structure together? Well, a few years ago, it would be difficult, and I remember we were running meetings with uh, 15 people in attendance. But nowadays, technology has helped us and the technology has brought together uh, people from different places, uh, different sites, and the multidisciplinary meetings and the multidisciplinary exchange in, of, of opinions and, and the discussions are very, very feasible. And actually, as we move into the digital world, we have more accurate data as well. So it's not good enough to say, Oh, there was an echocardiogram there which showed obstruction. That's not taken into account really in, in these discussions. We need to see the actual data. We need to see the data uh, all uh, first hand in, in these meetings where, wherever we make decisions. So it's feasible. It's becoming feasible. And you know that we actually have meetings like this. We run them weekly and this is happening. So let's talk about the time of the intervention as we are coming to the end of this presentation. 
So I think the, the key factor for this is the patient. So at the end of the day, we're doing elective procedure mainly to make the patient live better, to alleviate his symptoms, uh, perhaps to, to have a big influence on the lifetime of his disease and how he's going to experience it. So we need to put together uh, expertise, the clinical context of what we do it, his choice, and the safe delivery of the intervention. Guidelines are only going to tell us about a number, but we need to assemble all these. And what are the key elements of this specialist left ventricular atrial tract obstruction service? Let me see. I think we have, you know, ACM specialists, ACM cardiac surgeons, imaging colleagues, geneticists, electrophysiologists, interventional cardiologists. So they, all of them need to be involved in the delivery of the care. And I want to highlight that it's actually the, the specialist, it's, it's the team of specialists rather than individuals. And this is very important because the whole team needs to be uh, very well trained to manage this condition. So if we get everything right, what is considered to be the largest benefit from the successful treatment of LVOT obstruction? I put together here what the patient write to us after having a successful intervention for alpha drug obstruction. Some of them, they are going to learn that life wasn't meant to be like that, that they are not supposed to have a pounding heart when they go to the top of the stairs. They, they are not embarrassed, no have to tell anyone that they cannot breathe. So I think the major benefit is the improvement of symptoms and the change of the core of the disease for the lifetime. So Antonis, do you think some patients miss the boat? And this is probably answering the question that we have in mind. It's possible. If you think about it, young patients who uh, have obstruction for years and decades, they may have irreversible changes in their hearts and this is maybe what we, we can call as, as missing the boat. However, there are a lot of things that we don't know yet about. And the point you made earlier about the risk of the procedures we can offer to these patients is very important because if we can offer them low risk procedures, if we can offer them medication without any major side effects, and I didn't uh, mention much or I didn't mention anything probably about the new drugs coming because I'm expecting the audience to join us next year to hear about it. Um, I think that um, then we can intervene earlier. If the procedures come with a, a significant risk or the medications come with a, a significant side effects, then we will delay everything and then inevitably some of the patients will have uh, irreversible uh, side effects. So I think it's, it's all relative and, and, and I think we need to keep in mind that we should do things as early as we can to give the patients back a good life but of course not expose them to extra risks. Fantastic. So I I think, I hope you guys have enjoyed and you learned about the food obstruction. And we pass it to Brian and Amanda. Super. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Mighty and Antonis. That was a really, really super talk. You're you're a truly dynamic duo of uh, left ventricular right ventricular tract obstruction. So, um, thanks very much. Um, we, there's lots of questions, and I want to ask you some questions. So, um, if you come back or stay for the panel discussion, that would be super. Um, uh, I will move on and introduce.